Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, CSW Spring 2020 uh, event organized by HIPIC. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Future Generation Heterogeneous Computing event. My name is Karim Jemam. I'm from the School of Computing at the University of Leeds in the UK, and this uh, event is um, co-organized uh, with Clara uh, Petuela from Atos in Spain. So in the next five minutes, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction of a number of research activities we have been uh, undertaking for the last uh, three years now, uh, especially in the context of uh, an alliance. Uh, let me just in the context of the uh, alliance uh, actually known as the heterogeneous hardware and software alliance. Uh, this sort of um, alliance was, uh, was started uh, about three years ago at High Peak in, in Manchester and with the aim to simplify and optimize heterogeneity very much in the context of what is actually happening these days in the uh, under the sort of umbrella of, uh, of, of high peak. We have seen a large number, for example, of European projects interested in heterogeneity in so many aspects, whether it is actually software or hardware, operating systems, architecture, etc. So the aim was very much to try to pursue a common objectives within the actual alliance and, and potentially influence and, de and develop the heterogeneity, the, the heterogeneity market itself. So what we, what we basically um, uh, were aiming for was to look very much at a, a large number of applications that we see these days are very much uh, disruptive, whether they are, they come from um, uh, the internet of, of things, high performance computing, wearable computing, uh, it could be cyber physical systems, and more importantly these days, cyber physical systems of systems. And what was certainly interesting was that these this, uh, disruptive applications tend to run on, on various heterogeneous platforms, which could be uh, a typical uh, parallel computer, a mobile phone, uh, a grid, uh, as in the old days, or even a cloud. And underlying all this is very much the heterogeneous architectures where we could see really very much the, the a sort of hardware jungle uh, where this hardware jungle brings the cpus the uh, digital uh, uh, system processor uh, the, the digital system processors the multi cores the gpus the arrays the fpga the field programmable gate arrays and, and all that so what was certainly clear to the alliance was that there was certainly a need maybe an urgency to design more flexible software abstractions uh, and and uh, and and improve system architecture in order in order to fully exploit certainly the benefits of the heter of these heterogeneous platform, uh, platforms hardware and certainly architectures so in order to do that we basically try to have a large number of um, of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, forums in order to really understand the requirements of these uh, diverse applications and how they could exploit the heterogeneity of the hardware. And the, in order to find sort of, sort of best fit and certainly best path, we realized that the, uh, the, the old uh, hourglass model was still uh, very, uh, uh, very, very useful in the sense that we would like really to keep uh, you know, the, uh, the, this to the minimum, but certainly aim for, for the maximum. Aim for, aim for the maximum means trying to benefit a large number of different applications running on a very, very heterogeneous uh, uh, hardware. So we also looked at maybe the possibility of uh, defining a common architecture, which we see, we've seen very much as uh, a, a software stack that could uh, that we could maybe enhance in order to um, fulfill these requirements. And what we also did was that with the large number of, uh, of, of projects, we have approached mainly EU projects, but also uh, uh, 
uh, academic institutions and, and certainly uh, industry was to try to gather uh, tools and technologies that have been developed here and there as part of a catalog. So that catalog already exists now and, and everyone can have access to this, to, to this catalog and everyone can actually benefit from, uh, from all the, uh, the, the solution, the software solutions that we have uh, gathered so far. One thing that we certainly did as part of, the, of this initiative, trying to get requirement, trying to look to work towards a, a joint architecture was really to uh, have an application life cycle approach where we said, can we bring, for example, software designers and software engineers that certainly understand how applications are get designed these days, potentially how these applications get, get constructed, maybe through a, thanks to a programming model, how they can be deployed on, on, a, on, on a platform or, 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 a, or an infrastructure. And finally, what do we understand by the application operation itself? What would be certainly the challenges that these applications tend to uh, foresee when running on these heterogeneous uh, environments? What we also did was to uh, really try to get start looking at uh, setting up some working groups with a specific, uh, I will say, uh, a focus. The first one was on the IEEs and the software development kits. The middleware, the, the second one was very much tailored towards the middleware. The third one towards runtimes and systems. And, the, and the finally, the fourth one was very much looking at the heterogeneity of the hardware itself. By doing this, we realized that we could have a number of vertical, uh, I would say, uh, interest. Uh, and therefore, uh, we were certainly keen in looking at setting up a working group specifically for real-time systems, because again, real-time system was, uh, um, uh, was, was another uh, topic that would basically span over all uh, these uh, sort of layers in the architecture, but will bring its own specific requirements. Another one was HPC. Uh, another uh, uh, a seventh one was the embedded systems. And, and finally, uh, uh, the, the last one was very much the infrastructure, uh, especially that uh, there has been a quite a, an important uh, interest in cloud computing and these days in edge and fog computing. And therefore, that community certainly brought its own requirement when it came again to, 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 uh, to their own understanding of what was actually meant by heterogeneity. Uh, along these, uh, uh, along these efforts, we, we, we certainly managed to have a large number of, of, of discussions uh, through these working groups, uh, which certainly brought further questions with regard to the quality of service, uh, provision, security, and, and also energy efficiency. So the Alliance these days has a large number of members, uh, and the last statistics, I think we had about uh, 32 different members, 32, a total of 32 members. The, again, this brings uh, uh, academic institutions, uh, projects, whether they are currently funded or actually uh, um, have, uh, have been, uh, have been uh, uh, I would say, completed, and, and also a number of, uh, uh, of companies uh, from the industrial domain who are, again, interested in the, uh, in the, uh, on the topic. So today, uh, we so the, the 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 alliance itself tends to run a, week, uh, a yearly workshop at her, as part of High Peak in uh, in January. Uh, today, we simply uh, decided that we can bring a number of uh, uh, researchers and, and colleagues who are uh, members of the alliance to try to try to give us an overall view of uh, maybe a research problem they are, they are addressing and certainly give us a talk on, on the recent, uh, on, on some maybe uh, on providing some recent results. So the first talk uh, is apparently by myself, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about exascale computing and the aspect of heterogeneity. The second one is by uh, 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 Christos Catris uh, on resource manage managers for FPGAs and cloud deployment. The third one is by uh, Ayalos uh, Yanu on heterogeneous computing, the potential of seamlessly integrating FPGAs into future HPC systems. 
And finally, the fourth one is by uh, uh, Javi Nieto, who uh, will be talking on hybrid orchestration of resources and its future trends. Okay. At the end of this uh, meeting, we will have uh, uh, hopefully a discussion and you will have the opportunity to, have a, uh, to ask uh, questions. Okay, so this is very much what we, uh, what we are. And then uh, if you have any questions so far on the Alliance or on its, uh, on its uh, aim, please ask. Otherwise, um, we're certainly ready to move into the first talk. All right, so uh, here is uh, the first talk on, on exascale uh, computing, heterogeneity and deployment uh, challenges. Uh, just again, if you have just uh, joined us, uh, so my name is Karim Jemam. I'm from the School of Computing at the University of Leeds in the UK. And uh, it's my uh, pleasure to um, uh, introduce this uh, first talk uh, with uh, my uh, colleague uh, Hamish uh, Carr from the uh, from the same uh, from the same school. So um, we this talk is very uh, I would say informational. Uh, this is part of an ongoing um, uh, research uh, project on on exascale deployment uh, in the UK, and um, it's very informational because again it's it's not it, we, we don't have any sort of major results to share so far but hopefully it will certainly bring uh, a number of questions we are addressing uh, as part of this project especially when it comes to the heterogeneity aspect so uh as you probably know exascale computing is is almost here uh, if you look uh, historically at the uh, uh, number of exascale computing research projects that have been funded in, in, in Europe, in the US, in Japan and elsewhere, um, I can report, of course, that the EU, EU has been extensively um, uh, in, in, uh, involved in a large number of, uh, of funded uh, projects since 2015. Uh, and all these projects have certainly delivered uh, substantial, uh, I would say, results. And uh, what uh, and, and these projects have certainly focused on uh, a large number of topics. These topics would include fluid dynamic simulation algorithms, programming models for the exascale, many core architectures, data storage, reconfigurable architectures, and the likes. Okay, so. What is also important is that at this stage, uh, extreme scale supercomputers are being uh, uh, filled basically for this year and probably for the next, uh, and suddenly the next two years. I can give you the example of the US, which uh, obviously uh, would be uh, uh, deploying uh, three major supercomputers, uh, Aurora, Frontier, and, and El Capitan. So, why would uh, exascale computing matter? Uh, it would certainly, uh, it does actually matter because it will accelerate ex exciting advance, uh, advances in, in scientific discovery in a large number of diverse fields. It could be genomics, could be medicines, it could be market economics, it could be astrophysics, whatever. It will certainly uh, uh, also contribute to the economic competitive, uh, competitiveness. So, what are the actual challenges? If we look around and we see that uh, a large number of projects have already been taken place since, since 2015 and have looked at a large number of uh, aspects in relation to, uh, to exascales, what actually needs to be done now and what is actually the problem? And if there is any problem, what are the actual challenges ahead? So the, the, the issue is that uh, there, is still, there is still a need to create the separation of concerns that is necessary to ensure that we are actually ready for exascales, that to ensure that exascale applications deployment is actually there, that we actually know how to do it. So, and therefore, if, you, if we throw today a super uh, exascale uh, computer what is it again how are we going to use it how are we going to benefit from the research that has been done in a large number again of areas from from computer from from architectures 
to programming models, to simulations, etc. How can we then have a degree of what we call co-design, co-design, where we bring the computer scientists, we bring the computational scientists, we bring the research software engineers, the data scientists, and say, okay, with these are the next steps in order again to really deploy uh, um, uh, exascale applications, hopefully on these exascale uh, systems. So the way the, the reason why it's also important is because exascale hardware in itself ha, is will evolve and 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 as it evolves, software and applications would need to adapt. Because this is a completely different, of course, uh, environment and completely different settings. And as exascale application requirements evolve, then the hardware and the software design would need to adapt as well. So you will have again to play in various fronts here from the, from the hardware, the software and the applications perspective. Okay? And that's why, again, another reason why the significant degree of code design is required. If you look at this layered architecture, which again, a large number of EU projects uh, since from, from the 2015, 2020 and, and, and beyond have actually looked at is again, is you can expect an exascale application that will bring its own requirement that will bring certainly a lot of data. And this application will need again to be constructed thanks to a programming model and attached to this programming model is a runtime. These applications is likely to run to have some form of middleware to, su to support the job scheduling, the advanced res reservation, the workflow management, the data management, the data transfer, etc. And certainly have some, uh, some services attached. This could be optimization services such as performance and energy requirements. Finally, the exascale execution environment itself will bring the hardware, the heterogeneity of the hardware, whether it's a CPU, the many core, the GPU, the FPGAs, and as well as the heterogeneity in terms, for example, of memory. So what do we actually know about this hardware system? So the direction of these exascale systems is extreme heterogeneity. So we actually know that, and this extreme heterogeneity will often come with potentially reconfigurable systems. Therefore, expect in an in a, in a, in a heterogeneous in, in an exascale system to find a collection of heterogeneous processors. This could be the CPUs, it could be the same units such as GPUs, it could be configurable cores such as FPGAs. But what also see, what we also see is that there are the applications, whether they are from simulation, data science, and AIs, will also bring some very complex workflows. Uh, and these workflows will themselves in include a large ensemble of heterogeneous resources that uh, could be uh, certainly uh, be available on a, a traditional HPC tent center or maybe a cloud facility, potentially supported by edge and fog components. So we will have I will have a slide on this later on. So what will then happen is that if we take this exascale execution environment that is again ex extremely heterogeneous, you will have, have we will have then to find a way to um, automate the efficient mapping of all the building blocks coming from different applications across the, the complex uh, hardware heterogeneous landscape. More importantly, this um, this. Uh, application workflows will certainly need to do adapt to meet the infrastructure level objectives in the sense that when you run or, or, or you manage an exascale system, you will have said that certainly to ensure, for example, that your resources are, 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 are used at, the, at the, the, the way they are used at the right time, as, as it could be a utilization, it could be a throughput, it could be anything else. And therefore, the workflows themselves will need to adapt to meet these infrastructure level objectives. And one way we're, we're doing it at the moment is through the application of machine learning. When we look at the application design and development, again, nothing really new here in the sense that applications will get more complex. They will combine different modules in often a dynamic way and typical uh, programming models that are that have been that, that, that would certainly be a part of the exascale i would say uh, picture is mpi openmp pthreads and, and, and open acc so 
in this sense that these programming models will certainly need to be uh, revisited, will be extended, expect MPR to scale to the million of nodes, open, uh, expect OpenNP in Petra to be able to handle memory heterogeneity. Again, there's it's been already some research on, 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 the, uh, on, on, on this. However, when it comes to the actual deployment of these uh, uh, applications on exascale systems, there has been certainly interest in uh, using domain specific languages as higher level of abstractions, and at the same time, try to identify patterns that will allow the implementation of customized algorithms to optimize the load balancing, to optimize the data handling. Okay? So again, you will expect, even when it comes to the application design and development, to address these issues. When it comes to the actual uh, middleware, you can expect the dedicated middleware to manage the enormous complexity, of course, of these exascale systems. The variability uh, can come in different uh, uh, flavors. It could be the variability in application runtime that would, if it itself, depend, uh, be dependent on data locality, performance variability, and certainly the heterogeneity of the hardware, the hardware resources. You could potentially expect uh, increased interactivity to allow for the dynamic steering and quality of service. This is something that we are uh, exploring uh, in, in, uh, in land, for example, in the context of, visual, on, of visualization. So the middleware sitting between, again, the programming, the, the, the application and, and the actual uh, uh, hardware would certainly have a role to play in, in providing intelligent resource management thanks to automated methods. And then one way we are also approaching this is through, is through machine learning and, and data science. There will also be the issue of the, the, the technologies that would need to, uh, to support the data access itself for high performance exascale data analytics. I can uh, certainly refer here to two uh, very successful EU projects. Uh, uh, actually, Sage and, and Sage uh, number two would have actually specifically look, looked at, uh, at, at developing new technologies dedicated to exascale. So maybe as part of the overall picture and the overall economics, you could expect right to see in the middle some high performance exascale computing, for example, for example, in the traditional data center, you could have the disruptive applications and you can potentially have some form of support through a cloud, through an edge, or even through for computing. So expect to see uh, the, this era where we're moving from the PETA to the exascale. For example, expect to, to, to see 25, uh, more than 25 billion devices uh, connected again to the internet, maybe sensing some data, generating the, uh, the, generating the exabyte, and needing some, some, some processing. How would you again expect to have the software re-engineering to uh, ensure that you, your existing code is actually portable? You could expect to see new business models. You can expect to see a new application deplo deployment, for example, on systems that that include exascale facilities in the traditional data, the in the traditional HPC center, or a cloud data center, or a combination again with the edge and fog uh, components. At the end of the day, maybe this is time where we can start talking about exascale as a service, which is, uh, which is seen very much as part of the overall application workflow across a number of domains. Again, this could be the Internet of Things, Edge and for computing, and potentially cloud computing as well. Uh, so what are we really doing in our current research is that we are trying to get all these component parts all together. We are having an, an, a, a layered approach we are looking at a number of, uh, 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 of components within the software stack and how they, they, they actually not only interact with, uh, within, within the layer, but with the intra-layer. How do they work over time? How do they work within the context of this, uh, um, I would say, uh, new hardware architecture? So what you are putting in place is, again, is as part of, uh, of, of this um, uh, project, is, is, uh, is looking at addressing uh, uh, hardware and software environment issues, software abstractions, methodologies, et cetera. And again, really get the, uh, get the actual uh, readiness uh, in order to uh, tackle uh, the, uh, the exascale uh, deployment. One thing, one last slide is to do it specifically for the exascale workflows. Uh, we have a specific interest in that. 
This is to do because this, this exascale workflows have uh, bring a number of, uh, of, of challenges in terms of throughput, because we can see a large ensemble of simulations requiring massive numbers of jobs that cannot be uh, comfortably uh, scheduled. We could be the, the co-scheduling aspect. We could also look at the job coordination. More importantly, there is uh, other typical examples of parameter optimization for model refinement reproducibility and provenance. This is very much in, uh, uh, a, key, uh, a key research uh, agenda in, in the exascale. And finally, the data interpretation. So I will have to stop here. Thank you for, for your, uh, uh, thank you for, for your attention. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, Clara has 30 minutes, two minutes. Okay, thank you, Clara. So we can uh, have a, accept a question right now or leave, or leave it until uh, the end of the, uh, of the event of the seminar. Uh, it, um, it, Clara, you, you, you decide. Well, if there is one question now, we can solve it right now in the, the remaining time. Otherwise, uh, we can go to the next presentation. Okay. Okay. Okay, no questions apparently. So, um, Christo, the floor is yours. Thanks, Clara. Uh, thanks, Karim. A great presentation. Okay, so so this is a uh, Chris Carfis, Christopher Carfis, uh, uh, affiliated with Inaxel and uh, ICCS in the UAE. So, so in this talk, I'm going to to present the, the major challenges in, in the domain of um, heterogeneous deployment, mostly right about the resource management, um, the, the integration of the accelerators in the in the software stack, etc. And what what are the main challenges and uh, the the main uh, let's say solution that we can adopt, right? So, so usually. Uh, sorry, Christos, do you have a full screen mode presentation? Yes. Uh, uh, okay, see. because we are seeing a slide small. What about now? No, no, the slide, the slide is not small. It's it's at, it's we it is as it is. Okay, <laughs> then it's me. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> go ahead, please. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. So so usually when we are talking about um, you know the need for a hardware acceleration, there is this nice slide that shows that the computing power that needs to carry the, the machine learning, the, the neural network training, is, is almost doubling every uh, three to four months, right? So, so it is even faster than most know. And actually, this, one, uh, this was uh, when we were trying to, you know, to try in AlexNet, AlphaGo Zero, etc. And now the things are, uh, are even more worse, right? Because uh, when we are talking about the natural language processing and transformers, uh, when we have to train the model using uh, you know, millions of parameters, um, you need a vast amount of computing resource, right? So, so in, in order to face this challenge, of course, we need the hardware accelerators, right? Whether this is uh, uh, GPUs, FPGAs, uh, specialized ASIC, etc. right? So, so I think that this is obvious why we need now the, the hardware accelerators and they are here to stay. And, and actually, when we started uh, talking about uh, hardware accelerators uh, in the data centers, um, back, uh, let's say, five, six years ago, it was still you know, a research uh, project. But now you see that if you go, for example, in Amazon, in AWS, you see that you have um, a lot of uh, several different options in terms of the hardware accelerators, right? So not only you have uh, specialized CPUs like um, uh, compute intensive uh, or memory intensive uh, CPUs, but you can have you know more than 30 different types of uh, GPUs that you can uh, uh, deploy that you can utilize. And of course, since uh, 2017 or 2018, you also have the option for FPGAs. And uh, in 2020, they also added the, their own version of the uh, hardware accelerators, especially for deep learning application, uh, for inference and the, and the training, right? For a deep learning application, right? So, so you can see that uh, it is not an academic exercise anymore, but it is uh, widely used all over the world, uh, specialized hardware. So, 
so, so, so this is a nice thing, but um, the software developers, it seems that they care about uh, mostly about th three things. Uh, one of them is the performance. The second one is the ease of uh, programming. And the third one is easy of deployment. Of course, you know, everybody that is um, doing or developing hardware accelerators, they claim about how much faster it is, how much um, um, speed up you get, etc. But the thing is that uh, the users also care about ease of programming, right? So, so they don't uh, want you know, to, to have a, a super fast machine, but they don't know how to program, right? So, so hopefully now with um, CUDA and OpenCL, it is uh, much easier to program the GPUs and FPGAs, right? So uh, for example, for FPGAs now using OpenCL and C++ high, high level synthesis, it's much easier to, uh, to program the FPGAs and uh, develop the, the IP cores. But the, the software developers and the software users, they care about ease of deployment, right? So even if, uh, even if you provide um, uh, a very fast engine, they need to, uh, to provide the software stack that will allow very easy integration and deployment with the rest of the software stack, right? And I think this is where it's uh, the major challenge in the domain of hardware accelerator. Right, so um, I was watching, you know, the, the keynote from, uh, from NVIDIA and you see now that um, NVIDIA has acquired ARM, they now even more on the domain of uh, heterogeneous computing in, uh, in which they are going to have uh, GPUs together with ARM in the same, uh, in the same integrated uh, platform, right? Uh, so far, they were using the x86, and now it seems that they are moving to, to ARM-based servers. And so, so it will be very much uh, interesting to see what is happening in the, uh, in the next generation of data sets. And, uh, and the nice thing is that you can see that the companies like Intel, right, it's, uh, traditional um, developing data centers, processor, and, um, and computer processors, now they are expanding and now they provide um, fully heterogeneous platforms, right? So, so you can see uh, on the left side that you can see that we have the typical CPUs, right? So we have the Xeon and the scalable Xeon, uh, special developed for, uh, for servers. And uh, now they have also developed um, uh, their own GPUs, right? trying to of course, compete with NVIDIA. And uh, on top of that, uh, so almost three years ago, they, they acquired Altera. So now they also provide FPGA-based accelerators. And, um, and besides the, the typical GPUs and FPGAs, they have acquired also uh, Movidius. So, so, they, so they keep expanding the different kinds of platforms that they provide for, uh, for hardware accelerators. And um, probably you, you, you have seen that uh, last year they also acquired Habana Labs, I think it was for $2 billion, uh, that it was specialized for the acceleration of uh, deep learning training uh, and uh, deep learning inference, right? It was the Goya and the Gaudi uh, chips, but it was uh, developed by Habana Labs. Right? So, so you can see here that, uh, you know, the heterogeneous computing, it's uh, it's not an academic exercise. It's not, you know, something uh, futuristic, but it is actually <laughs> here to stay, right? And um, the software developers and the software users will have to, to decide uh, early on the design process which of these um, hardware accelerators they are going to use and how they are going to deploy and how they can change between uh, this kind of accelerators. Right, and so, so it is hard to decide and uh, even uh, Intel is providing, let's say, a kind of uh, guidelines on how to select which platform uh, to select for uh, which application, right? So uh, you can choose CPU if you are uh, using the deep learning accelerator, the deep learning uh, software stack uh, in order to speed up some kind of uh, deep learning application that is not so much uh, uh, compute intensive or you can go to a discrete uh, AI accelerator center, or, or in this case, if, uh, if you're doing uh, training, you can use the Habana Labs uh, frameworks, um, the Habana Labs platforms, or the GPUs. And if you are doing, uh, or if you are mostly interested about inference, 
uh, you can use the, uh, the vector processing units, you can use FPGAs, uh, depending in, uh, if you are in, uh, in the domain of IoT, on the edge, on data centers, there are different kinds of, uh, of accelerators that they can be used there in, in this case. Right, so, so, so you can see that now uh, the heterogeneous computing and the, uh, the option for heterogeneous computing keep increasing uh, significantly. And it will be much harder, you know, to decide and to deploy your application or migrate your application from typical CPUs to, to a different kind of, uh, of platform. Right. So, so you can see here, this is the heterogeneous computing from, from Intel side, right? When they have the, the Xeon, they have the Atom, they have the Agile X and the Stratix XFPGAs, um, special purpose uh, ASIC Habana Labs and the, the GPUs and the, the Movidius for GPUs. Like, right? So, and uh, if you go, you know, deeper into the, the options that you have, then uh, things get uh, even more complicated, right? So in the case for FPGAs, for example, there are different kinds of, uh, of FPGAs that Intel provides, like the ARIA 10, Stratix 10, and uh, Agile X, um, uh, all of them with different uh, uh, characteristics in terms of bandwidth, no memory processing, uh, uh, lookup tables, etc. And so, so what we need, you know, and the, what are the main challenges of the FPGAs? Um, I, I think are the, the the four following. One of them was uh, that it was very hard to develop the hardware accelerators for the FPGAs, and I think this this has been partially solved, right, using the OpenCL and C++ and the high level synthesis. So now it's much easier for somebody that hasn't done, uh, you know, with prior, with uh, no prior knowledge on FPGAs, he can program the FPGAs and he can develop his own accelerators. Uh, the next uh, challenge is how you can scale out your application, right? So supposedly that you have one application and you want to scale it on, uh, you know, four FPGAs in the same server. Uh, I, I think this has not been solved, right? Uh, so far, you have to do it manually. You have to, partition your data, you have to do uh, the, the job scheduling almost manually in order to, uh, to dispatch the jobs to different kinds of FPGAs and then to manually gather uh, back the results. So, so it's, it's, it's very challenging on how you can easily scale out your application on multiple FPGAs. The other thing is that uh, there is no virtualization on the FPGAs. That, that means that it is not uh, very easy when you are in a, in a university, for example, especially now that you have to do remote, uh, you know, labs, uh, how you share the one FPGA, for example, among uh, 10, 20, uh, 30 different uh, students or different users. Uh, there is not the option for virtualization and you don't want, you know, uh, your researcher or students to start asking, okay, now I want access, no, now it's my time to have access, etc. And the time slot, the manual time slot, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very nice, so right, right? do it manually. So, so we need more frameworks like uh, frameworks uh, similar to what we are available in the domain of CPUs and GPUs that it will allow easy sharing of the hardware resource in the same way that it is done in the CPU. And of course, uh, once you program the FPGA and once you, you, uh, you develop your own accelerator, it's very hard still to program and deploy your accelerator. Uh, for example, in your host code, you have to explicitly specify where exactly is your bitstream file, uh, how exactly it's going to be done, the communication between the host processor and the FPGA. So this makes things uh, much more complicated compared with other um, uh, hardware accelerators. Right. And of course, there are different solutions provided by, by uh, you know, uh, for example, industry vendors, like the one API provided by, by Intel, that um, uh, promises that it will make much easier uh, programming and uh, not only programming different kinds of uh, hardware accelerators, but of course, um, uh, the easy of deployment. Uh, of course, this is uh, still challenge, right? Uh, first of all, the, the One API only applies for the uh, Intel platforms. It's not vendor agnostic. And the second thing is that, is that uh, still in cases that you are talking about FPGAs, Still, in your host code, you have to deploy, you have to specify where exactly is located your bitstream file, how it's going to be done, the memory transfer, etc. So, so it's not exactly, let's say, uniform across the all different uh, accelerators. Right? 
And, and of course, there are other proposals. For example, Xilinx has its own uh, runtime system that uh, allows developers to develop the, um, uh, their application on top of the, the Xilinx FPGA. Right? Oh, of course, again, it is vendor specific. It doesn't apply to any other uh, FPGA. Right. So, so things are, uh, you know, much easier in the domain of the GPU world, right? So NVIDIA, for example, provides the, uh, the whole software stack, meaning that it uh, provides the GPU operator that allows easy integration and deployment of uh, GPUs uh, using, uh, you know, containers over Kubernetes, etc. Right. They also provide GPU monitoring, so, so they make it much easier uh, for uh, for applications to deploy in the in the GPUs, and I think we you know it's um, it's not rocket science. What we need to do is you know to try to provide the same infrastructure and the same uh, solution that it will allow software developers and software users that they want to uh, speed up their application uh, on FPGAs in case that FPGAs are better than uh, GPUs in the specific application to provide the software stack that it will allow. Um, let's say this uh, seamless integration, right? So for example, in the domain of GPUs, there is this company run.ai that they provide, for example, in the domain of GPUs, again, uh, much easier cluster management, runtime system and orchestration across the cluster of GPUs, right? So uh, Bitfusion did almost the same thing in the domain of GPU. So, so I, I think it's very critical to, to have a software stack in the domain of FPGAs that it will allow um, very easy deployment and integration of FPGAs across, uh, you know, uh, programming uh, frameworks and uh, programming languages. Right. So uh, it, it is very important to have a software stack, uh, the whole runtime system, the cluster manager, etc., cetera, et cetera, that it will allow software application to be deployed, uh, you know, from a single container through Kubernetes in a cluster of FPGAs making much easier the deployment of FPGAs in, in the data centers and in the cloud, right? So you, you see now more and more companies and the cloud vendors are utilizing the FPGAs. Uh, uh, recently, Azure also announced that they are going to have FPGAs, uh, the Alder cards, as, um, as uh, frameworks for the, uh, as instances in the Azure uh, marketplace and uh, data centers. Right. So, so, and uh, across, you know, for, uh, across uh, Europe and across Horizon 2020, there are several projects. One of them is the, the Melodic project that we're participating in that case, and uh, that allows cross cloud um, uh, deployment, uh, meaning that the deployment across several clouds and the migration of the application from different clouds depend on the application requirements. And uh, if we want to, uh, to, uh, to integrate FPGAs, we need to provide the software stack that it will allow easy um, integration with the rest of the of the cloud software stack, right? So, um, for example, AWS, Alibaba Cloud, uh, I think now Azure, they also provide FPGAs as an instances. So, if we want to allow uh, cross cloud optimization and cross cloud uh, you know, fully deployment, and we want to to support FPGAs, we need to have this uh, this uh, software stack. And of course, there are several other uh, projects on the domain of the uh, uh, on the domain of the utilization and the integration of FPGAs in the cloud. One of them is the Evolve Horizon 2020 that ICCS is also participating, in which they uh, we, they develop the framework that it will allow the hardware accelerators to be uh, integrated across you know, HPC cloud and data center in a, in a very coherent and uh, integrated way, right? Um, there's also this uh, new project, the Serrano project, that it is also allowed the transparent application deployment in uh, accelerated cloud um, uh, framework, continue, right? So, so this is a very nice project that um, shows how we can integrate hardware accelerators on the domain of the cloud in the most efficient way, right? So, as I said, you know, the, these are the most important challenges, um, uh, the performance, the ease of programming, and the ease of deployment uh, that, that I think it's very important, right? So, so for example, like what we are doing at Inaxel is that we, uh, we develop this software stack that allows um, a, a single application deployed on a single FPGA to automatically uh, migrate to a multi-tenant deployment on a cluster of FPGAs, right? So, so that means that it allows multiple users 
to share a cluster of FPGAs without having to manually do the dispatching of the jobs. And uh, they have to do manually the, the resource management and uh, uh, the, the, the deployment and the scaling of FPGAs, right? So it provides, let's say, uh, a coherent integrated way that uh, software users can deploy their application on FPGAs uh, as easy as it is done in the software domain uh, using CPG, right? So they just invoke the software function that they want to accelerate without having, you know, to, uh, to specify where exactly is located the bit stream, uh, where exactly is uh, how the memory transfer is going to be done between the CPU and the FPGA, etc. Right, so, so that make it much easier what we have seen in application like uh, uh, financial application, genomic, etc. It make it much easier the deployment and the integration of the FPGAs, right? So, so we try to provide, let's say, the, the exact sof software stack that it is provided, let's say, by NVIDIA or other vendors in the domain of, um, uh, of FPGAs, right? So, so the idea is that you hide all of the complexity about the bit streams, about the resource management, etc. And you provide an abstraction layer that allows the easy integration of, uh, of FPGAs from uh, frameworks like uh, Java, Python, Scala, uh, programming languages, or frameworks like uh, Spy. So that way you can solve all, all of these major uh, problems that I mentioned, right? The, ma the major challenges that I mentioned, scalability, uh, resource management, sharing of the resources, and the uh, easy of deployment. So, so, so you can think of it if you we if, if we see, take these uh, three pillars: you know, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. We we, we try to provide, let's say, the, the framework that uh, allows you to move from you know from infrastructure as a service to a platform as a service, and uh, if it is combined with a ready-to-use IT course with a uh, to a software as a service. Right. So. Uh, so using this framework, it makes it uh, much easier uh, FPGAs to be integrated with frameworks like uh, Kubernetes, Apache Spark, uh, Keras, uh, Scikit-Learn, uh, Jupyter, Kubesphere, uh, Taro, etc. And now currently we are doing an integration with uh, Red Hat with OpenShift that it will allow much easier deployment of FPGAs over OpenShift, right? And uh, on the rest of uh, and on top of that. With several other frameworks like MindsDB about um, SQL databases, etc. Right. So, okay. So, so of course, there's um, a lot of uh, related work. It's uh, Tornado VM, uh, API, Matter, etc. Other frameworks that I will not mention now. But overall, I think oh, there is a lot of um, uh, there is a lot of hype, and there's a lot of acquisition, and you know, movement across this area. About the uh, bit, uh, bit Fusion was acquired by VMware, uh, AMD recently acquired Xilinx, so we are in the process. Right. So, so I think um, uh, that summarizes all the major uh, challenges in the domain of FPGAs and uh, how they can be very easily integrated on the domain of uh, data centers down the environment. Right, so, so I think this is a very uh, exciting research area, and with uh, a lot of need for um, deployment, immediate deployment of FPGAs in the data center in the cloud. So, so I think this is a very nice and promising area to, uh, to do some research. Right, so, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Christos. Uh, you have a question um, from Eric, which is asking you, uh, can you easily port an OpenCL program written for a GPU to an FPGA? If you can migrate. I mean, yes, to port it. Yeah. Yes. So um, in order to migrate it, yes, it is possible. But uh, the thing is that it doesn't allow, for example, uh, it's not easy to go from CUDA, let's say, to OpenCL, right? So, so you need to develop the hardware accelerators uh, using the traditional design flow, CUDA in the domains of GPUs and OpenCL in the domain of FPGAs. You need to have them in place in a repository. And uh, as long as you both have, uh, you have both of the IP cores, both the GPU and the FPGA IP core in different formats, then yes, uh, it's, it's, it is possible to do the migration automatically, the migration from GPUs 
to, to the FPGAs in that case. Okay, thank you very much, Christos. So I'm going to pass the floor to Angelo, who is uh, going to present the third challenge. So um, please. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, hopefully it's okay. So, uh, Hi all, I'm uh, Angelo Suan from Synelixis, Greece, and uh, I'm glad to be participating in this uh, series of talks about uh, heterogeneous computing. And uh, I'm going to talk about the potential of integrating FPGA into HPC systems. So um, after the very nice talks about uh, Karim and uh, from Karim and Christos, I'm going to focus a bit more in uh, mostly in the other side, in the hardware side. So. Um, we're going to see a bit of the current trends in the usage of FPGAs and also talk about the FPGA potential in general. Uh, we're going to see some ongoing efforts on uh, using FPGAs and uh, we'll have a glance of uh, a proposed architecture we call Yoni Logic that is aiming in uh, easing the usage of FPGAs in uh, big systems. Uh, starting so a bit reversely, we see in the seeing the cloud and the data center domain. We see, for example, that um, Amazon uses uh, Xilinx FPGAs in uh, its one its in its F1 instances. We also see the super vessel, for example, for using uh, the open power cloud an open power cl uh, cloud platform uh, by IBM Research, which uses a uh, CPUs. Uh, Paired with FPGAs and um, points out that it can uh, achieve up to 90% uh, uh, lower power consumption uh, for the parts migrated to FPGAs. Also, the Microsoft uses uh, FPGAs uh, for the, its well-known uh, search machine uh, Bing. Baidu, one of the largest companies specializing in internet-related services, also uh, aiming at artificial intelligence, uses uh, FPGAs. Uh, from Xilinx, um, also the Azure cloud computing service, uh, as also Christos mentioned, uses FPGAs. Uh, apart from this, uh, the Nimix cloud deploys the HD Axel development environment uh, for application uh, offered by Xilinx. And also other big companies like Alibaba and Tencent uh, use FPGAs. Also, we see advances like um, support for libraries. For example, Xilinx is supporting uh, an OpenStack uh, library uh, that includes um, support for deep neural networks for uh, math uh, equations and um, like a matrix multiplication, for example, between coding and decoding, etc. However, if we see the HPC domain, uh, in the HPC, we have uh, applications that are uh, hungry for uh, performance and so become quite uh, power demanding. But in order to build, to, to build the bigger machine, one of the main challenges is, uh, and has been in the last few years, the power efficiency. Because from since quite a few years, uh, we can't just scale processor clock as it's infeasible due to power envelope restrictions. And also, we cannot just add uh, many other processors uh, because we were going to hit the power consumption wall. So the scientific community has made the shift to heterogeneity, which is uh, highly seen in the HPC domain. So we see all the big machines uh, using uh, single structure mild data architecture, mainly uh, focused on GPU and vector processing as the number one in the, in the top 500 list that uses ARM-based processor and vector many cores. Oh, for example, the Summit computer uses uh, a mix of uh, CPUs, uh, vector and uh, GPUs uh, all, or others um, here, like the Tayanche or others also in the green uh, 500 list use uh, Xeon and Xeon fees that are, again are GPU-like architectures. But here in this domain, we don't see any use of FPGAs. And why is that? Um, FPGA have, a, have very good capabilities and become even and even more promising in the latest years. Uh, they can be used to implement reconfigurable accelerators with a streaming data flow execution model as opposed to the usual von Neumann flow of execution. They are very energy efficient and uh, also the, we, they can offer a great performance gains, especially for applications that are well fitted uh, uh, for FPGAs. 
also year after year, they come uh, more versatile. We see uh, high bandwidths uh, and uh, large memories. Uh, for example, now we have chips that have uh, high bandwidth memories, uh, large memories that also offer a very high bandwidth. Also, they support uh, and offer a good memory hierarchy with uh, local SRAM, high bandwidth memories and off-chip DDRs. They include thousands of DSP blocks for processing, which are very good for even fitted for accelerators and also um, offer some uh, vector units. And uh, also we see many other flavors like the Versal FPJ, for example, that offers that offer artificial intelligent engines. Or also we see multiprocessor system on chips that uh, actually are coupled the FPJ fabric with the uh, processing systems and which are also very promising and uh, uh, we use them a lot in uh, our proposed architectures. And uh, furthermore, um, uh, they, they support all the, the FPGAs now support impressive communication capabilities with uh, hundreds of transceivers that each can reach uh, more than uh, 100 gigabits per, per second in throughput. So why FPGAs are not still used in HPC? Uh, as also the previous presenters mentioned, uh, we have really limited programmability and tools. And uh, mostly the tools that exist now are optimized uh, in a single applications running on a single FPGA. So there is limited support for uh, FPGA management by the operating system. And uh, even more for uh, an application execu executing in, uh, in parallel multiple FPGAs or even reversely of, uh, of uh, multiple applications sharing the sources of a single FPGA. Also, the, we see that there are many FPGAs, FPGA choices and sizes, and all these affect the accelerated tasks and uh, how we implement an accelerator. And all these create a huge design space that requires uh, very specialized software and hardware skills. So unlike multi-cores or uh, GPUs or any of the like, uh, the programming flexibility for FPGAs is not well supported. So in a few words, uh, it doesn't matter if you build something very fast, if it's hard to program. So what you need is to combine the, something that can offer a very good performance with high programmability. So uh, it will be easier to exploit FPGAs if we had an architecture that would offer a simple programming environment that would help build a simple programming environment uh, by offering a parallel execution on a multiple FPGAs or in a single FPGA, allowing an FPGA to be shared by many applications or, uh, or, or even an application using uh, the many FPGAs. So uh, there has been a lot of research on the use of FPGAs and uh, Many of these research point out that uh, the power consumption that is uh, uh, that is uh, inherent in FPGAs is very useful for uh, uh, the HPC domain, but because they lack programmability, it's very difficult to deploy. Uh, well, there's also been a lot of work in HPC applications that have been proved to become very efficient when ported to. Uh, to FPGAs instead of CPUs and GPUs, but all these works uh, usually emphasize on a single, F show results for single FPGAs and emphasize that uh, they could, it's very difficult to move uh, to many FPGAs and they uh, have a parallel execution. We also see a commercial uh, multi FPGA system like those from Amazon, Maxeller, etc. But usually this multi FPGA system uh, have a tightly coupled uh, processor like an Intel processor with an FPGA board. Bo uh, these two are connected through PCI or even use the Ethernet connectivity. So in this way, uh, FPGAs are just user coprocessor, so they have limited or if not at all uh, direct communication. However, the communication between FPGAs, which is very promising and it's very helpful as um, it's crucial for the overall performance of a, a big infrastructure uh, is not used and uh, even um, uh, published work uh, uh, does not uh, include a high number of FPGAs. Uh, however, uh, hopefully there have been a lot of research in European uh, projects 
Uh, for example, we'd like to point out the RACO system that uh, build that was built that that build an um, accelerator sharing uh, for applications on uh, but focused on single FPGA boards, and also the Vineyard approach where also Cachris uh, uh, was uh, in this project and. Uh, it uh, its same was to build programming frame, frameworks and middleware in for multi FPGA platforms. Uh, as in the hardware, let's say domain in the uh, FPGA multi FPGA platform domain, uh, there have been a work by the EcoScale project uh, in uh, within which we also uh, build and uh, developed our architecture, which it which was also. Uh, cooperating with the sister project Exanest, which uh, was focusing mainly on interconnect and storage in uh, multi FPGA systems, and the Exanode, which aimed in uh, providing a, a, a better and uh, efficient uh, reconfigurable node. Actually, now the Eurexa, the currently running Eurexa project, tries to leverage on all these three projects. While through the Optima project that uh, just uh, started, we try to use uh, the platforms created by this project and uh, try to build on those uh, platforms and have uh, a commercial uh, accelerate commercial applications running as accelerators efficiently. So if we we are to take a look in the proposed architecture, which uh, the hardware architecture, which we call the UniLogic. It's, uh, it aims to be a scalable architecture for multi FPGA platforms so that uh, hundreds or more of uh, accelerators can be spread uh, and used in hundreds and or more of FPGAs. So, in this way, it can offer and leverage improved programmability in these multi FPGA platforms by allowing the seamless usage of all the reconfiguration, the, the reconfiguration resources of the system. And uh, this is also done by virtualized sharing of FPGAs with hardware virtualization mechanism for uh, high efficiency. And uh, this allows uh, a single application to use multiple uh, accelerators spread across the system or uh, reversely single accelerator, for example, being shared by multiple applications. Uh, this uh, unilogic architecture is uh, based on a partition global address space, which uh, includes both the memory as usual, but also the accelerator. So uh, application can deploy accelerators anywhere in the system, as we said, and so, so as as they can do with memory, but so also the accelerators again can see and um, access the memory of all the system in turn. Uh, also, they can profit uh, from the movement of computation close to data, not only with the usual form of uh, moving the data close to the computation, but also by moving the computation close to data uh, in the form of a configurable, uh, dynamic reconfigurable accelerator that can be um, moved around and. Uh, uh, configured around the system. Uh, so also on top of that, uh, users can uh, can have access to the hardware resources either by um, uh, ready build accelerators in the form of uh, libraries uh, or even build their own custom uh, accelerators. Uh, so if um, if we want to see a a high level uh, an abstract uh, view of this of a system that uh, deploys a unilogic uh, uh, architecture we can see for example here that the partition global address space unifies the memory of a cpu based core so we see here for example a multi cores in the form of cycles uh, uh, accessing the memory across the whole, the whole system while in this system the unilogic adds a uniform access to reconfigurable logic. So uh, any, again, any uh, processor as it, as it did with the memory, now it can do with the accelerator. So it can access any accelerator in the system. And in turn, all the accelerators in the system uh, can uh, reach uh, any memory across the platform. Uh, 
If we see a building block of such a system that in Unilogic we call worker, it's actually in a simple way, it's a user conventional, conventional processing unit uh, with, a, with a DDR memory and with a, uh, attached to the reconfigurable accelerators. But the reconfigurable accelerators are accessed through accelerator controller, which actually provide the virtualized access to these accelerators. So sharing uh, is easy for the applications. And uh, many of these workers uh, can be connected and communicate through a hierarchical uh, infrastructure. Uh, for example, if we see a compute node uh, including four such workers so with the CPU and their connection and the reconfigurable logic, uh, they form a node and many of these nodes uh, can form a bigger system. While in this node, um, an accelerator can be used by multiple, uh, by multiple application and also application can use either local or remote accelerators, one or, uh, or one or many. Uh, many of this, um, uh, this uh, excuse me, this infrastructure is uh, decoupled, so we have a different uh, portion of the system for the static logic, which offers the interconnection and the control of all the accelerators. And then the accelerator come in place in form of dynamic reconfigured accelerators, uh, so they can be added and moved around the system. Uh, Again, um, as we said, uh, much of many of these nodes can be added uh, and uh, uh, be, build a better system, build a better, uh, bigger system. To have hands-on, we moved on in these projects and uh, build uh, platforms that uh, used uh, many MPSOCs and uh, uh, have implemented the uh, realized the uh, architecture. Uh, for example, here we see the Quad FPJ daughter board that has four MP socks by Silings tightly coupled in an all to all interconnection. It was built by Ford within uh, the Excellence project. And uh, eight of these uh, come in place in a, um, in, a, in a blade, in a big board, in a big uh, baseboard that uh, offers uh, a favorable uh, topology. Uh, so that the uh, accelerators and, uh, can, can easily communicate. Uh, and also going further on and having a glance at the, um, uh, at the implemented uh, blade, let's say, uh, we have uh, built a system that works in a one user C size and we have connected some of those and building bigger systems. Uh, finally, it's interesting to see um, uh, the the liquid cooled system also uh, as was also uh, in connecting many FPGAs. This one was built in, within the Exanet project. As we said, it uses liquid cooling and it connects up to 16 blades, uh, reaching more than 2,200 20, FPGAs, and it's hosted at the Foundation of Research and Technology in Greece. And um, um, it's uh, interesting to point out, uh, closing this presentation, that uh, the just started the Optima project aims at leveraging on these platforms and uh, efficiently porting and running uh, quite a few interesting uh, commercial applications, both on this platform by Exanes and the previous platform by Ecoscale. Um, thank you. If there are any questions now or later. I'll okay, thank you, Angelo. So is there any question? Okay, so let's wait for the Q&A uh, section. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Javier. Hi, everyone. So let me share my screen. Okay, here it is. Can you see the presentation? Yes, Javi. Okay. So I'm Francisco Javier from Atos. I uh, lead the group of advanced parallel computing in uh, Atos Research and Innovation. And well, uh, what I'm going to present you is uh, the solution that we have for hydration resources and how 
um, we see the, the future trends and, and the kind of things that we, it will be necessary in order to still enable uh, this orchestration in an efficient way uh, in an environment in which we are going to have uh, a large heterogeneity uh, with respect to those resources that have to be managed. So first of all, about the problem itself, so I'm going to maybe to talk about a higher aspect, uh, I mean, a high level view, uh, not like uh, the, the previous uh, talks. Uh, so from one side, we have uh, new applications um, in, in many domains that are requiring more and more resources and uh, with a higher complexity. Um, you have seen several examples in which uh, it was mentioned that uh, they require more energy because they require more computation and, and systems are becoming more complex. Uh, so uh, what we have is that apart from the typical uh, CPU systems that are heterogeneous by themselves because uh, all these processes are different and, and uh, in order to optimize you, you require different uh, compilation of your codes. You also have many heterogeneous devices today uh, already available uh, like GPUs, FPGAs, you have TPUs as well, you have uh, uh, many cores. But apart from that, uh, what we expect uh, in the following years is also to have uh, quantum computers uh, and also uh, neuromorphic computers, these kind of things. I mean, these are solutions that are there, that are being developed uh, and that uh, will be used in the near future, I would say. So what is the, so that, that's one problem that developers and users have, and, but uh, it's not only one, it's also accessing the infrastructure itself. So what happens when you want to run uh, your, your application is that uh, you may try to run in different cloud infrastructures, each one with its own interface. Also, if you need to use HPC, it happens pretty much the same thing um, because uh, you have different schedulers which are using different commands. Actually, you have to learn about the common, uh, uh, the common line. Uh, so it's very difficult. And uh, well, you, actually you have, as I mentioned, different commands uh, for uh, not only sending the jobs, but also to, to uh, retrieve information about the status and all these things. And also you have the issue of the data management. So it's okay, I mean, when you are moving small files, uh, but what happens when you move uh, large files? Okay, then you cannot go through the typical uh, solution like FTP, HTTP, because uh, usually if there is a small glitch in the line, you will uh, I mean, the transfer will fail. So you need to go uh, with more complex solutions like uh, uh, FTP or uh, things like Airclone that uh, manage connections and. Additionally, another thing that happens is that the, uh, they are complex to use. You have to learn more command line the, uh, interfaces. So all these things are complex. And what we see is that uh, there, are, there are several needs that have to be fulfilled uh, from our side uh, for all these people. Uh, first of all, uh, from the point of, uh, of view of the heterogeneity of the solutions. So you need to learn many APIs, programming models. Uh, you already have seen that uh, if you want to use FPGA, you have to use maybe OpenCL, but if you go with uh, NVIDIA GPUs, you need to learn CUDA. So it's complicated. And you need to manage all these things because later you need to access those devices. Uh, we are talking about very complex technologies. So uh, it's not just learning a couple of commands. You have to learn many of them and understand what's going on in the background, right? And you need to configure things in such a way that they will work for you. So the point is to reduce the complexity. Right? This is what we what we think that has to be done. So how we see the management of the applications execution in this context? First of all, uh, we have this idea of hybrid orchestration, uh, in which we combine different types of resources. Uh, so we have. HPC from one side, uh, where you may uh, be running uh, complex simulations that require a, a huge number of, of, of nodes and cores and that uh, parallelize very well. Uh, on the other side, you may use cloud platforms as well. Uh, this is maybe for uh, a bit more simple applications. And also you have to take into account that there are new devices. Uh, you, you may have it's uh, uh, servers or a small, even a smaller devices. You may also use things like quantum computer. I mean, there are already a few quantum computers available, but at least you can, uh, I mean, they are not very accessible actually, and not for production, I would say, uh, but uh, you can access, for example, simulators and prepare your codes, things like this. Um, and of course, you uh, you can use uh, this combination in order to optimize the execution of your applications, right? Uh, 
we have to be aware that uh, some devices are very good for solving some problems, but are not so good for solving other problems. So GPUs are very good uh, for image uh, analysis, but maybe they are not so good for uh, certain simulations, right? Uh, and this also happens with uh, machine learning. You have uh, GPUs, the TPUs as, as well are very good. Uh, the point is that there is this trade-off between the cost and the performance, um, even including this energy consumption uh, aspect. And you need to, to, to deal with all those things. And of course, also with the data, uh, because uh, in, in this idea of um, having part of the of the application executed in HPC, for example, or the part of the application running uh, in a cloud platform, perhaps even using some uh, FPGA or, or GPU. Uh, but if you are doing this, then you also have to deal with the uh, data movement and data management part because it takes time. Uh, and if you want to speed up things, maybe it's not, so you, you have to be careful because you can't. Uh, mess things up, right? So the point is, how can we reduce the execution time and the cost associated to uh, to that execution? Uh, here it comes the, this concept of the meta, meta orchestrator, uh, which is the one implementing this, uh, this idea of the combination, right? Uh, so we have whoop, um, this application at the high level, oops, sorry. Um, which is basically, uh, so it takes a workflow in which you have very clear tasks uh, that have to be executed. Uh, we call these building blocks. Usually it's, it's, uh, it's possible to have this in modular applications where uh, you can differentiate very clearly the different parts of your application. And what happens is that the orchestrator uh, is interacting with uh, the schedulers from the HPC side and also other orchestrators or directly with the uh, the, the APIs of some cloud infrastructures, right? So uh, what we do is um, yes, to request them to run some tasks. So in the end, you are relying on the uh, research man management and allocation that they are doing themselves. Uh, the point is that from our side, what we can do is to select the most appropriate one depending on the task that you want to run, right? And also another thing that we need to do is to monitor the execution, right? Uh, it's necessary to know what's going on. Uh, and it's also necessary to know the status of the different platforms in order to be able to take a good decision. And as I mentioned before, it's, ne it's necessary to deal with the data movement and management. So you need to know where to move the data, if you need to be applying some caching, caching mechanism somewhere, uh, if you need to, to do uh, uh, some special uh, kind of a special transformation of the data and things like this. So the point is that, okay, we can enable, enable this uh, hybrid solution between HPC and cloud, uh, but how should we deal with the heterogeneous part of the platforms, right? Because if you are only using uh, CPUs, uh, it's not so complicated, but it, it's a bit more complicated when you are dealing with uh, these heterogeneous devices. So um, our orchestration solution itself, just to, to tell you about some features that we are able to, I mean, that, that these are things that we have today. Uh, so we have a meta orchestrator that it's a, a able to uh, connect with many uh, different cloud platforms and also support uh, some HPC um, infrastructures uh, uh, with the schedulers like Slurm, Torque, and PBS Pro. Uh, we express the workflows in Tosca, um, which is a typical solution used in cloud so far. And this is good because in, in the end, it's possible to have some kind of integration between these uh, uh, different kind of platforms. So everything becomes more standardized. And um, then we have some additional um, features uh, like uh, that supporting the, uh, an easy data transfer between cloud and HPC using solutions like Grid FTP. And uh, we can even also publish data sets in SIC and SIC is a, a data catalog uh, solution. So basically you can publish uh, some metadata about your, uh, your the outcomes from a simulation or your application, and you can just leave the data uh, in, the, in the right location. Uh, and also we have solutions for uh, doing monitoring. We can monitor not only cloud infrastructures, but also uh, we can collect uh, information from uh, HPC uh, infrastructures like uh, some your statistics, uh, what, what's going on the queues, uh, things like this. Uh, and we can link that with uh, an accounting component and uh, even we are working also in a service level agreements. 
So again, how is this used? Okay, you have the uh, some Tosca file in which you, you define uh, your inputs. Uh, I mean, it's not very complicated. You have another part for defining the infrastructure definition. So this is the, which infrastructure are going you uh, are you going to use? Uh, giving some basic inputs like your credentials and things like this. And then when you need to specify your tasks, you have a part in which you just you specify how you deploy uh, that concrete task of your application and then how you execute, right? So and here everything is okay. The point is when you start to include things like uh, uh, data management or data movement tasks that are included also uh, in the definition of the, of the task, um, things become uh, a bit more complicated and uh, and the point is that today we don't see the way uh, or it's not so simple to to deal with the heterogeneous uh, devices so how i explain or how i express uh, that i want to use a gpu or fea or something like this right uh, so what happens here is that apart from that, what we see is that uh, we are going to have a new kind of architectures. Some of them are, are already available. Uh, others will come uh, in, the, in the next years. Uh, so for example, we start from uh, devices like uh, mobile phones or some small devices in the uh, with uh, connected sensors and things like this. Uh, what we may find today is um, this uh, concept of edge computing, where we may have different devices collaborating together in order to process some data, which is being generated uh, in that area. Uh, it's possible to have uh, some of these uh, nodes in the edge, which are more powerful uh, and that can process more information, uh, generating some kind of local clouds, something like this. Um, here I include, uh, this indication about the European Process Initiative, because uh, as we are talking about the heterogeneity, it's important to take into account that um, EPI is uh, um, an effort from the European Commission order to have a European processor. And what they are doing right now is uh, they are proposing a solution which is modular, in which you will have some um, cores which are uh, just for computation, other cores are GPUs, other cores are uh, multi-core, uh, other cores are F uh, small FPGAs, and what they are doing is defining different combinations of all these uh, different cores in order to have some processors for the edge computing, other processors which are for uh, HPC. And, and the point is that this will be available in the next years. And some devices will integrate that. So in the end, we, ha we have to take into account that this is going to happen, that we will have that kind of devices that, that we need to understand how to use them. And the point is that with this architecture, uh, there are things that you can compute there in the edge, but also you will find that you need to do some computations in the cloud part and also in the HPC part. And here again, I mentioned that the, in, the, in the HPC part, we will have uh, so, uh, some systems with the European Precision Initiative, which means that we will have uh, GPUs, uh, FPGAs, and, and many other devices. And apart from that, uh, what we expect in the in the next years is that we will have quantum computers which are attached to the to the HPC center, to the HPC system itself, right? So we have, we have another new kind of, uh, of device. Of course, uh, as it has been mentioned, uh, it's possible today to uh, use some cloud uh, solution in which you have, a, a, you can request in VMs uh, access to FPGAs or, or GPUs. So the heterogeneity is everywhere in this, in this kind of architecture and we need to deal with this. So which are the areas to improve in that sense where, with respect to this hybrid solution that, that I've been mentioning before? Uh, so first of all, uh, we need to understand how to indicate that the, the, these devices are there. Uh, we, we need to be somehow abstract. Uh, and we need to, to abstract the complexity of the systems, but we need to indicate that the devices are there and can be used, right? Also, we need to, to uh, express uh, what we require from the application's perspective. Uh, so how we indicate that the, my application is going to need some GPUs or uh, or it's going to need FPGAs or it contains some, uh, the concrete task, uh, it requires some quantum computer, right? Uh, also, I, I mean, in the end, this makes things more complicated. Um, but I mean, in the end, we need to uh, make the specifications for, the, uh, for these applications as much simple as possible because we are talking about uh, uh, enabling things at the higher level and reducing the complexity for uh, the users and for the developers. Um, 
So examples on, on how we are doing these things today. So uh, in the case of GPUs, uh, we are working in a project in which uh, we are working with CESGA, which is the supercomputing center in Galicia. And they have some nodes uh, which uh, have GPUs, uh, but not all the nodes of the system have GPUs, right? Uh, so the point is when we want to access those nodes, what we do is to access a specific queue that they have configured. So the jobs that you send uh, to that concrete queue uh, is going to run your, your uh, applications in the nodes with GPUs and not in the other ones. So this is a way to solve the problem, but in the end, this is, let's say something, um, I think temporary, right? At some point we will need the schedulers to understand what's going on in the system and to uh, make a, a smarter selection of the nodes. Also, from the cloud perspective, you may have different uh, flavors of the VMs, so you can select uh, concrete VMs that have already configured the, uh, the access to the GPU or, or to the FPGA. Okay, so in the end, it, it, there is a possibility to do things, but um, it's, um, it is still not uh, very complicated or at least not, it's not possible to address the problem uh, in, the, in, in the way it should be. Uh, another point is how can we be uh, can we be more efficient? Um, so okay, we know that there are some devices uh, that we can use in order to improve the performance and the execution of our applications. Uh, now the point is uh, how uh, we allow to the orchestrator to understand this and to take better decisions. So from one point, it's uh, to to do some kind of profiling of applications uh, that is related to the way in which we express what the application is going to need. Uh, we will need to implement some uh, intelligent models in order to do the, the selection of the of the provider when it's possible to run in different, uh, for example, in different clouds or in, or in different uh, HPC centers. So we'll need to do these kind of things and calculate, of course, calculate the trade-offs uh, because as I mentioned before, it's not only the computation, but also uh, the way in which you move the data, right? Another point would be this uh, the part of uh, a distributed orchestration. So right now, the typical way in which we work is uh, we have um, a, an instance of, of one orchestrator and that, that instance is just contacting directly to the different providers. Uh, it could be different cloud infrastructures, it could be different HPC centers, it, does, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the point now with um, uh, the introduction of these um, distributed architectures and edge computing, uh, it will be important that uh, we enable the possibility to uh, have different orchestrators that are going to collaborate together and that take into account that uh, they need to, to talk with the edge part, right? In which you, you may have uh, some devices which are uh, suddenly disappearing or appearing. Uh, and so the environment is, is more dynamic. And a last point that, that I think is very important is the is the code portability, right? Um, this is important because, uh, as in our case, we want the, to have the possibility to uh, run uh, an application or part of an application uh, in different uh, providers. Uh, it happens that, uh, for example, the, the people from uh, Stuttgart has not the same processors as the people in Barcelona, uh, which means that you need somehow uh, to uh, adapt the compilation of your code in order to be efficient. In that sense, um, there are solutions like SPAC that are used uh, today and that we see that it will be possible to integrate something like this in the interpretation solutions. And actually this is something that uh, we're going to do in this, uh, in the project Hidalgo. So conclusions, yes, and I'm finishing. Um, uh, first of all, uh, again, simplicity. Uh, uh, just want to define one word from, from our application and be able to run many times in many places. So I don't want to, to take care of a, a compilation for a, every a kind of processor or a GPU or whatever. I mean, I want things simple. And that is directly linked to this complexity abstraction for developers and users. Um, we were able to support today this concept of uh, hybrid orchestration uh, for multiple uh, multiple platforms, uh, but we understand that we need to uh, make wider this concept of uh, hybrid, uh, supporting more solutions and more architectures like uh, edge computing. Uh, 
And of course, there are uh, important challenges to address uh, from the high level perspective, uh, like uh, how to express the heterogeneity, uh, how to, to address the heterogeneity in order to include intelligence in the orchestrator so you can do a better selection of uh, providers. And finally, as uh, I was just mentioning before, the portability, right, to be able to, to recompile things. And that's all from my side. I think I'm in time. Okay, thank you, Javi, for the presentation. Uh, there is a question in the in the in the tool. I don't know if you can read it. Otherwise, I can read it for you. Uh, currently, in top uh, 500, the most powerful computer is uh, Fugaku. That is not an, uh, an heterogeneous computer accelerated with FPGA or GPU. Considering the programmability wall, how do you see the future of heterogeneous system in the context of exascale computing? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, as I mentioned before, if you take a look at the European Processor Initiative, um, one of the things that these processors are including is uh, different kind of, uh, of devices. I mean, they are going to have small cores for FPGAs, small cores for GPUs. So it's something that you are going to have sooner or later, basically because um, I think that uh, it was Akelos that uh, explained it before. Yeah. Uh, so there is some kind of wall uh, between the capabilities that the CPUs can give you and the amount of energy that, that they consume. So for solving some problems, in the end, you need to go uh, to uh, a specific device, which is going to be much more efficient. Otherwise, it may happen that you need basically a nuclear plant just next to the HPC system because there is no other way to, to, to fit the system with enough energy, you know? Okay. Anyone else can complement the, the answer? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just, just want to mention that the, um, also the FUGAP, which is a kind of a hybrid approach because it uses a very wide vector unit. But apart from that, uh, it first appeared as a small, um, it's a small implementation in the green 500 list. And now, for example, again, in the green 500 list, we see uh, going higher with uh, better flops per watt with, uh, uh, for example, now number one is uh, topped by the NVIDIA, a, a, a full NVIDIA approach using uh, NVIDIA and AMD uh, CP, CPU. So, uh, I think heterogeneity for high performance of application is something you cannot avoid. Yeah, okay. I, will, I, will, I, will, I, will, uh, I will. I will. support that. Uh, it's again. It, it. It is clear that the the direction of exascale systems is is in itself extreme heterogeneity, and and therefore always ex expect to to have as part of these systems reconfigurable. Uh, components because the configurable computing has certainly shown, as uh, as, uh, as explained in, in, in all the uh, the uh, the presentation, that it's actually it's actually paying off. Okay, so I hope answer uh, has been answered. Uh, next one is uh, from Jose Luis Guisado. Uh, do you already have a meta orchestrator in production that can deploy tasks on both cloud, for example, OpenStack? and HPC, for example, as Slurm resources? Yes. So we have a solution based on Cloudify, um, which, uh, which is called a Croupier, uh, which is a, a kind of plugin for uh, Cloudify that does, uh, provides a support to uh, Slurm, uh, Torque, and PBS Pro. So it's possible to have, uh, so I mean, we have workflows in which we have tasks uh, running uh, in the part of HPC and tasks running in the part of cloud. For example, uh, what we have seen is that uh, we can do that um, in cases in which you are doing some pre-processing of the data that uh, could be done in the cloud, uh, especially if you are not uh, using uh, large amounts of, uh, of data. Then the, the simulations are executed in the HPC part. We have done this, for example, with Gromax. Uh, we had a workflow in which we were doing a small pre-processing, then some simulation with Gromax, and then there was a post-processing that was also executed in the cloud part uh, with, the, with the data. And the part of the post-processing actually probably it, it has even more sense because 
uh, you have to be aware that the, after you run your simulations, uh, you uh, you have uh, just some time until the your data is uh, removed from the HPC center. So basically, it makes sense to get the data out of the HPC system to have maybe do uh, doing something some something else in the cloud system, and then just leave the data where you want to have it. So this is something that we have done, and uh, we have it running. Okay, so Jose Luis, if you want to get in contact with uh, Javi, he can give you more details about that. Uh, so any other uh, question, uh, please do it um, either writing or talking. Not only questions, also if you are working in similar research areas and you want to comment uh, on your work, uh, it's also very welcome. Can I uh, maybe do have a, a quick comment? Sure, Karim, please go ahead. I think it was um, Aguero's uh, presentation um where um there was certainly uh, we, we 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 the presentation addressed the the actual uh, issue with multi fpga systems right and um and i was wondering whether we are really seeing in the real world um multi fpga systems taking off outside the academic groups and, and maybe the niche uh, users in industry. Okay. I was just wondering again, whether it is what is really happening in the real world in terms of again, multi FPGAs. Uh, hi, Kar Karim. Yeah, hello. Yes, hi. So, so if, if I can answer this question is that uh, we see actually, we see uh, several applications where multi FPGA uh, deployment is required. One of them uh, was in the domain of a financial application, right? So, so they had to, to speed up the financial application and they had a cluster of FPGAs that uh, they wanted to, uh, to, to utilize, right? So in that case, they had, uh, let's say, uh, two or three different process or threads. And uh, these threads, they had to dispatch the jobs to, to a cluster of uh, four or uh, five FPGAs, and they didn't want to, to do it manually because it was very error prone, right? So, so in that case, um, um, for example, they used a resource manager from, uh, from, from us that allowed easy uh, job matching and uh, resource management, right? So, so this was a, a one use case. Another use case was about on video analytics. Uh, vi video analytics, is, it's very computational intensive, and there was a company doing um, uh, uh, doing analytics in this case, and uh, th they had to use, for example, a cluster of uh, four FPGAs for all the cards in order to do phase detection and the rest of uh, other applications. Right? So, so th there are several applications, mostly in the domain of genomics, I would say financial and video analytics uh, that uh, there is this requirement for multi FPGA deployment. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. The, if I'm to think aloud here, uh, actually, the, I, I could think of many applications that would uh, benefit from the very low latency of uh, inter FPGA communication, having the accelerators uh, communicate uh, with each other. But uh, if it's uh, if if your thought is have, has to do with something already commercial, uh, mm -hmm. I can't uh, mention anything mm -hmm. at least now in my mind. Okay. Thank you. Okay, there is no more questions from the audience. Okay, so um, I don't know, um, uh, Karim, if you want to, to close uh, the session uh, or just um, recapping what we have uh, seen during these uh, during these four presentations and yes. uh, so, summarize so, the, the conclusions. 
Yes, so for, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, all, all the speakers for uh, uh, their presentations in, in the scope of this future generation heterogeneous computing. I uh, also hope that the, uh, the audience has uh, found uh, certainly uh, interest in the, in the various uh, topics and subjects from, from exascale computing to resource management to, uh, to, uh, to integrating FPGAs into, into future HPC systems and, and finally into in, in regard to hybrid orchestration of resources. So one, one, one thing is that um, heterogeneity is in itself bringing a, a large number of, of challenges here and there. And, um, and, and, and obviously, again, we, we, we will certainly uh, um, have to, uh, to address uh, all, 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 all these issues, uh, whether again, you know, it's on the individual uh, basis, uh, academic level, uh, industry, and, and, and certainly uh, high peak itself. So uh, I may just again want to uh, to thank the, uh, the the audience for for their for, for their interest and uh, let I will close this uh, this event and hope uh, to see you uh, soon in uh, in future in another future uh, high peak event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So.